So good evening, everyone. It's now eight o'clock on Saturday, 27th of June, 2020. And it's time once again for us to breathe some infectious air. Uh, so I hope everyone's gathered and ready to breathe together and to be open to infection or to have a strong immune system, whichever feels good for you. So we've been tracing in this series the progress of an infection. And uh, we've taken the idea of, of the infection in two ways. One, which is very obvious, we're living through a global pandemic and uh, the air is infectious. So we're looking at these six sessions in terms of the six stages that can be identified when a virus enters a host cell. So in the first two sessions, they were about contact. The first session was attachment. When the virus first attaches itself to a, a host cell. The second session was about penetration, which is when it becomes absorbed into the host the walls close around it. And now in this next two sessions, it's about synthesis. So today, we're going to be looking at, an, at uncoating. This is the moment when the viral package sheds its uh, layer, its membrane, and its contents are released to mingle with the host cell, uncoating. New sensibilities become uncontainable and spread to become indistinguishable from their host. The visitor removes his coat and makes himself at home. In the streets, brass bands and marching bands ring out Buddy Bolden's cornet rings out from late 19th century New Orleans. When does a strange noise become a familiar tone? So now that we're all gathered here, we're going to start off this infectious air session in uh, by now the traditional manner, which is uh, a rendition of a piece called Silent Harmony. So currently everyone's microphones are muted. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to unmute your microphones and share your air and we can see each other and hear the various glitches and computer noises and ambient sounds and perhaps birds singing or children wailing or your stomach gurgling or just your thoughts whirring around in your head and in the air between us. So just for a minute, let's share our silences. So if you'd like to unmute your microphones now, please.
If you'd like to mute again now, that was very beautiful. Like three quarters of it one as well. Yeah, I remember it being like fun. So, uh, yeah, that was inadvertently, on the, that so Isaru can. Uh, yeah, I mean, while it's also. And help to clear the space now. So, that first piece was a collaboration between all of us and uh, spread the music out into all of the different spaces that we're in to include all the different geographical locations from which we're zooming in now. So that was space. And now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Roland, to take us on uh, a journey through time and consider how a sound can be infectious across a huge swathe of time. So we're going to go back now a few decades with Roland Sutherland. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Anselma. And um, <clears throat> just want to reflect a bit before I go into that. And um, just to say, it's, it's really funny. I've been feeling quite spaced out lately. And it's just dawned on me that um, basically kind of been locked up in my flat for over three months now, only venturing out perhaps once a week. And um, I think it's only now it's, it's kind of started getting to me. <clears throat> so um, the funniest thing I've realized is that I do seem to have a bit of paranoia when it comes to going out. And um, the amount of hand sanitizer I get through is something quite ridiculous. Also, you know, the wearing of gloves whenever I'm in the supermarket, the mask, it almost seems like a bit of a ritual as soon as I leave the house to the moment I get back. But anyway, it'd be interesting to hear how you've dealt with this virus and how you've coped and how it's affected you. Just thought I'd mention that. So I'd like to uh, speak about a musician, an artist, who was a really remarkable musician. And his name is Charles Buddy Bolden. He, he was born, it was just after the American Civil War, probably a decade or so he, he came into being. And uh, he grew up in the New Orleans area in America. And what his father used to do, he used to take him, take him out when he was, when he was really young, he used to take him out to see the various brass bands and marching bands that would be on parade. That was, that was a regular occurrence in um, New Orleans at the time. And the young uh, Charles would get so excited. You know, he'd be in awe of all these bands. And it was, it was basically something that stayed with him for a very long time, the sensation of experiencing and feeling these bands. So eventually, um, as he grew up, he took on playing uh, the cornet and you know, worked really hard at it and eventually became a band leader and developed his um, improvisational skills. But what people noticed was that he was doing things that a lot of the other uh, musicians of the time weren't really doing. 
and uh, he really stood out because because of his improvisational skills uh, it was it was just a, a extraordinary thing to there is to suddenly hear someone playing some of these familiar tunes but able to with ease just improvise around them so that was um, quite a new thing then and it brought into into a lot of attention well he was so enthusiastic as well that during his formative years he he, he learned so many instruments and he basically could play most of the instruments that you would find in a brass band so when it came to the time of him leading his own band he was able to demonstrate to his players exactly how he wanted something to be played And he was quite a perfectionist. And the other thing about him is usually he'd play everything by ear. So there was no kind of like sight reading involved when it came to learning music and performing music. So I'd say it was around probably 1896 when he was getting it together with his bands and um, rehearsing them up and venturing out. So with the music, I mean, the Ansemann mentioned an uncoating. And what he did was he uncoated such music as spirituals, folk songs, marches and hymns into his own way of playing. So the music now had a new feel to it. You know, it had different phrasing, it had a different shape to it, different sound. And it was heightened by his extraordinary improvisations. His brass band became pretty unique. They, as a, the band as a whole, just had a, had a new way of playing. And he introduced some new phrase into the music, which gave it uh, a, a kind of lilt. And um, I don't know, I can try and sing it for you. This this rhythm he introduced. It would be like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, ba, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, ba, ba. You know, it had a real lilt to it. The people would flock to his gigs because a lot of dance music would be uh, you know produced. He'd be playing a lot of mazurkas and waltzes and uh, polkas so part of the performances he gave were basically dances and because of everything he brought to them in this, this new sound with the bands he, be he became a superstar you know he was the biggest thing in town so, so things were really going well for him he played in places like globe hall odd fellows hall and lincoln park And through his skills, that's basically what helped bring about ragtime music. He kind of like provided the birth of ragtime music, him along with an amazing pianist called Jelly Roll Morton. He managed to sustain things for about 10 years, but during the last few years of that, the pressure started getting to him. You know, the demands trying to stay at number one. It all started getting too much for him. You know, I know I touched on paranoia earlier, but he started suffering greatly from paranoia and was losing it. So he turned to, to drink and uh, became an alcoholic to the point where the situation got so bad he was committed to an insane asylum. And he was still very young, he was only about 30 years old. That was around 1907. And sadly, he remained in there until he passed away in 1931. And by that point, most people had kind of forgotten about him. 
So he reached such heights and um, brought such amazing things to the music. Only to a few years later, just be, be forgotten. He was buried in a pauper's grave. But fortunately, a few years later on, since his passing, quite a few of his band, former band members and that, started paying tribute to him, realizing the, the magnitude of what it brought and how it um, changed a lot of things. So it wasn't long before um, his name was up there again. He was rightly acknowledged. And uh, and remembered again. So that's Buddy Bald, Buddy Bolden, Charles, uh, Buddy Bolden. And what I'd like to do for you now is is play you some music, just a little bit of music, just so that you can get a feel for what a brass band sounded like back in those days. And. Um, one of the big features of, of the brass band is, is playing, playing for funerals. So you'd hear a funeral march uh, procession. And um, also from this brass band, you'll also hear a dance number that was typical of um, what they would have played in the, in the halls. So I'll invite Ishu to play this track for you. Here it comes. sense the vibes that would have been going on back then in New Orleans. Very vibrant. And that was the Magnolia Brass Band. <laughs> Thank you. 
and that was uh, Willie Bunk Johnson, a cornet player. And he actually used to play in um, Buddy Bolden's band. And so um, you, you, get, you get an idea there of, um, you know, how the uh, brass players played. And that was a tune called Making Runs. And um, incidentally, he was accompanied by a pianist called um, Bertha Gonsulin. And uh, she incidentally studied with, um, you know, that great pianist who I mentioned, uh, pianist and composer, Jelly Roll Morton, who um, had connections with uh, Buddy Bolden also. So that's Buddy Bolden. So I'd like to move on now. And I'd like to introduce to you a really wonderful trumpet player of our time. And uh, we had the pleasure of um, playing with her not so long ago. And her name is Charlotte Keith. And uh, Charlotte Keith is going to play something for us. Thanks, Charlotte.
Thank you very much, Charlotte, for kicking us off into that. <laughs> um, so I'd like to introduce um, our second guest, Liam Noble, who you've already heard a little bit in that uh, group in improvisation that grew out of Charlotte's amazing, amazing evocation spirit of Buddy Bolden. Spirit literally is uh, a breath. And Charlotte uh, really helped us feel that breath from a century ago. But uh, Ian now is going to take us uh, somewhere else. Um, and I think Liam also has uh, been thinking about 
this era of marching bands and the kind of tunes they would play and uh, the kind of places they might march to that have been hitherto unimagined. So um, Liam Noble, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Anderson. Um, yeah, I thought I would speak a little bit first just because my experience of lockdown has been quite strange because I've got a baby. So instead of having loads of time to think about things, I've got no time to think about things at all. Uh, which I think some people would be quite envious of that um, and others not. I, th I think it's just been very interesting, an interesting time. And it's been interesting to see how many people are having different experiences, what is great for somebody and luxurious for somebody is is very difficult for other people you know so i'm kind of somewhere in probably in the up the privileged end of how things have been um but you know it's it's interesting just being forced to do things with very little preparation as i'm about to show you <laughs> um but I was thinking about, I've, I've always been a massive, big fan of ragtime, stride piano, that era of jazz piano playing, which is quite often ignored in in, in uh, educational kind of circles, because it's not an easy entry point to play. It's like I always say to people, if you, if you studied the history of jazz piano and you start at the beginning, you never get past the first 10 years of it because it's so it's so difficult technically to get it right um, but um, one tune that I've had going around in my head ever ever since I was asked to do this project and um, we've been talking about marching bands is this tune called Sing On um, played on this recording I've got by the Eureka Brass Band and they're they have this kind of incredible mass of sound, which is, um, yeah, I don't know what to say about it. It, 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 it. it starts off like almost a kind of classical thing, playing very straight sort of tunes. And then suddenly something will happen and it, it goes into this complete other area. Like everybody's still there playing the same instruments, but they're on another planet. They're in this kind of dancing kind of thing. And this tune is one of those. It, it kind of starts with a mili very military sounding drum thing, which actually on Roland's track, they did a similar kind of thing. It's very, very, very straight. And then suddenly it gets all funky. Somebody does one thing and the whole thing, uh, jumps to life so I'm going to try and do that <laughs> on my own <laughs> I mean the other thing about playing piano in lockdown is you can sort of play a whole piece with the bass line and the chords and the melody it's a lot easier to do it on my instrument than it, than it is on Charlotte's I think but um, still I'm going to have a go so this is Sing On
Thank you very much indeed, Miriam Noble. So, um, in the last 10 minutes of this session, I, I see from the chat window that um, lots of people have been, uh, there's some amazing things there, which uh, uh, look like they're very rich, rich pickings for people to uh, read later also. But now, uh, I'd like to invite anyone to drop words or phrases or images into the chat window and uh, if the musicians can have the window up at the side of your screen, we're gonna try to, uh, we're gonna try something now where we kind of treat it as a score and uh, we'll be responding to the words that you put in the chat window as well as each other. So Charlotte, Liam, Roland, are you up for that? By all means. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, and the rest of all of you out there in infectious air, are you up for that? Okay, so uh, yeah, we're just gonna we're gonna improvise, play, and we'll be listening to each other, and uh, also we'll be reading what's in the chat window, and uh, a message from Isuru has just come in that if you'd like to contribute with audio then you can ask Ishuru to unmute you, which he will do judiciously as the DJ here. So, uh, yeah, and we're going we're gonna to finish by nine o'clock. So thank you very much. Let's go see what happens. Pride, 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 oh, pride, pride, oh, pride. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Beautiful, beautiful uh, outside broadcast from the streets and amazing words and incredible playing under very unusual circumstances uh, on Zoom from Charlotte Keith and Liam Noble. Thank you very much. Uh, from me, Ansuman Biswas and Roland Sutherland, RNA. Thank you very much. I hope you've really enjoyed sharing our infectious airs and uh, we look forward to seeing you for the next one in in two weeks thank you very much indeed for coming and see you again thank you all it's been fantastic thank you thanks for having me it's really yeah. great fun thank you for yeah thank you for having us <laughs>